everybody. Today, we're gonna shoot the cabin fever challenge hey. with the... F yeah, oh, over here. What? What? Well, wh where are you? Oh, there you are. Uh, do it again. Okay, all right, let's, let's, let's do that again, yeah. Action. Hi, everybody. Today, we're gonna shoot the Kevin hey, Fever. dog breath. What now? Camera's here. Look over here. Well, I, I, oh. Oh, okay, well. Yeah. Do it again. Oh, God. Third time lucky, I guess, eh? <laughs> Action. Hi, everybody. Today, we're gonna shoot the cabin fever challenge with this mini rifle. Wait, hold, hold on, hold, hold on, hold on. Mini rifle? Come on. Well, yeah, mini rifle. I can see that. It's small. We're shooting with the Minier rifle, the P-51 Minier rifle. I mean, look, like Inkerman, you know? Come on. Oh. Oh. Jesus. Oh. Do it, just do it again. Come on. Yeah. I was wondering what all the great coat in this bear skin, well, okay, never mind. All right, I, I got it. I'll hold on, I'll wait right here. Action. Hi, everybody. Today, we're gonna to shoot the cabin fever challenge with this. Minier rifle. Right, cut, cut. Thank God. Did I do that one fine? Did I get that one? I thought we were never gonna get out of here. Oh, thank goodness. Ah. Ah. Right, print that. Hey, check the gate. Maybe I'll get a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame one day. Well, that's right. It's that time of year again. Thanks to Richard at the Rifle Terror Channel, it's the Cabin Fever Challenge 2024. Now this year, as mentioned, brought to you by the P-51 Minier Rifle Musket. Now I am definitely looking forward to this one. So this is a special year because not only is the P-51 getting its sort of competition debut, shall we say, uh, this rifle is one of the most iconic, yet one of the most little known service rifles in British and Empire service. And this was essentially only used in the Crimea with some small exceptions in South Africa. It's a massive 702 caliber and uh, I mean, <laughs> as you'll see later, the bullet is about literally the size of the end of my thumb. Anyway, as you can see, there's no snow. So uh, that means no snowshoes, like last year. Uh, that means no sitting in snow, like in years past. So for this year's impediment, I've chosen this. That great, big, furry cap. Yeah, let me tell you something. It impedes. But I'm telling you, it looks magnificent. This is the eighth time shooting the Cabin Fever Challenge and the eighth video I've made to date. I'd hate really to bore everyone with more details of the rules and such. Of course, these can be found at riflechair.com. But in summary, muzzleloaders are Division 5, four rounds at 50 meters, one each, standing, kneeling, prone, and sitting. You record the time and the hits and enter those into the formula to get your score. Under Richard's guidance, the challenge has grown to international dimensions. His team has done well to nurture the challenge like a well-cultivated bonsai plant. Well done, that man. This year, after careful thought, balanced with the fact that I'm already heavily involved in working up this rifle, 
And I've also recently finished a gargantuan project in the Ingerman series featuring this rifle in part. It seemed a natural fit to use one of the channel's newest arms, the P-51 Minier rifle. This rifle was the product of the late 1840s developments in expanding ball ammunition with a hollow base. It represents the first generally issued rifle in British service, though it was never issued generally across the army, if that makes sense. The channel's example dates from 1852 and appears to be somewhat of a time capsule in that it bears no unit markings and came into the fold in near perfect condition. Very much the product of the Lovell era of British military arms, the 702 caliber barrel is held in place with iron keys versus pins and features the Lovell catch for the bayonet. The sights, the first ladder type set mounted to a British service rifle for the common soldier, extended to 900 yards and serve as testimony to the capabilities of this new yet imperfect technology emerging from the late 1840s. The barrel is rifled with four grooves equal to the lands and are cut at a twist rate of one in 78 inches. Gazing at the bore looks like a tunnel to another dimension and it's just about as big. Which brings me to the ammunition. And it's big. Shown here compared to a round for the P-53 Enfield rifle musket, it represents a generationally inferior style of bullet. It is still of essentially musket caliber, and it used a metal cup, iron historically, in the hollow base to ensure expansion of the skirt into the rifling upon firing. This was proven to be somewhat less effective than the wooden, later clay plug, which ultimately replaced it in the Enfield's bullet. As an aside, by late in the Crimean War, after the initial issues of the P-53 were undertaken in 1855, moves were made to differentiate the natures of ammunition. For this reason, the P-51 cartridge by the late 1850s was made with red fine paper. During its initial service, however, and for all the major field battles of the Crimean War, P-51 cartridges were made in the usual white paper. With a nominal caliber of 0.69 inches, the bullet for the P-51 makes a very girthy cartridge comparable to the older smoothbore musket ammunition, and consequently needs an ammunition pouch that is bigger than that used with the P-53 Enfield and its .568 bullet, which came later. The ammunition pouch used with the P-51 was that intended for the smoothbore musket before, and held the entire allotment of 60 rounds in six packets. This is a substantial weight, and really drives home the long-sought principle of lightening the soldier's burden, with ever-decreasing calibers of ammunition. 60 rounds of P-51 ammo makes 60 rounds of P-53 ammo seem like make-believe. The way the ammunition functioned made the P-51 the first of its kind in British service, pioneering the reversing cartridge that would later define P-53 ammo, the P-51 cartridge, essentially the same, was torn open at the powder end with the teeth. The contents, some two and a half drams or 68 grains of powder, was poured down the barrel. Then the cartridge was reversed and the rear of the bullet, which was assembled into the cartridge with its nose pointing inwards, was pushed into the muzzle. The powder cylinder was snapped off and the bullet, with the paper still wrapped around it, was rammed home. Lubricant was applied to the bullet end of the cartridge to ensure loading was as smooth as possible and fouling was kept to a minimum. After the customary two taps to ensure the bullet was fully seated, the ramrod was returned and a fresh cap was placed on the nipple, ready for the next round to be fired. Now, I must admit, I am still heavily involved in working up this rifle, and because of this, I felt compelled to confirm a few things before I shot the challenge, namely the point of aim. All my range work to date has been at 100 yards, and there I found it to shoot slightly left. Therefore, a bit of windage to the right, combined with a slightly lower sight placement, was what I figured sufficient to hit at 50 meters. This I did, and the results seemed to confirm things. With that, I was ready to go. So on went the bearskin cap, and I loaded the first round. 
Now, I'll talk a bit more about the experience with all the getup a bit later in the video, but suffice it to say, this generation of infantry personal kit had been essentially unchanged from the late 1770s, when the bayonet belt was moved from the waist to the shoulder. It was functional enough to use while standing, but as we shall see, left lots to be desired when in other, more prostrated positions. Time is taken in the Cabin Fever Challenge from the first shot to the last shot, so the initial loading can be done in your own time. In years past, I have shot the challenge with a knapsack when appropriate. As I was shooting this year under the guise of a Grenadier Guardsman at the Battle of Inkerman, knapsacks weren't worn in that action. An inclusion that, quite frankly, I was happy to avoid. The first reload went along okay. Using the large, singular ammo pouch at the hip is not as ideal as the later expense pouch worn on the front of a waist belt, but I could get the cartridges out with acceptable ease. Now, I'll talk later about it, but you'll notice at once that I'm carrying the percussion caps for the rifle in the right-hand pocket of the greatcoat. Again, not ideal, but given the context of the historical, necessary. I elected to use the kneeling position to load, twice in fact. This view gives a good idea of the somewhat awkward nature of supplying ammunition from the large pouch. It all has to be done by feel. Thankfully, the large compartments in the tin allow for relatively easy withdrawal of cartridges. Loading from the kneeling position was a bona fide technique, and the version shown here was for the men kneeling in the front rank. Those kneeling in the rear rank, in a skirmishing context perhaps, used a slightly differing method. Thus far, things had mostly been straightforward, but as I lay down to shoot from the prone, things started to go off the rails a bit. The cap came loose on my head and needed a bit of adjustment. More importantly, the change in angle of my head brought the fur down in front of my eyes more than it had been in the other positions. Then it all went off the cliff. As I pushed up from the prone position, the bearskin fell right off. Sure, I could have just left it, but I felt that wasn't exactly in the spirit of the exercise. So, a bit of faffing ensued. Speaking of faffing, I went for the fourth round in the pouch, and lo and behold, it wasn't there. A quick glance downward found it at my knee, apparently having fallen out of the pouch. Now, the pouch does have an inner lid, so included for extra security and weatherproofness. But apparently, the muzzle-loading gods didn't care this day, and cast their meddling influence into multiple aspects of my efforts. As I entered the last furlong, I knew that this hadn't been my best effort, but I figured that at least nothing catastrophic had occurred so far. Again, the fur in front of my eyes played havoc with my sight picture, and more time had to be taken. You can clearly see the angle that the cap is tilted to in this position. I was happy, quite frankly, to have it not fall off my head again. In some ways, I was happy to have gone through the exercise with this towering piece of headdress, even if it had cost a significant loss of time. Oh, there's the target! <laughs> oh. Just, whew. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what's funny, uh, apart from the target, I had to move the camera back like twice to get the framing for this because of, well, <clears throat> standing a bit taller today. But anyway, so there we go, the 2024 Cabin Fever Challenge, shot with the P-51 Mini Rifle. And it looks like I may have got four hits. One, two, three, and this here just broke the black, which I, as I believe, counts. 
That round just broke the black by the slimmest of margins. My time was a somewhat disappointing two minutes and 33.7 seconds. So plugging those numbers into the formula gave me a total of 13 points. As this is an historical shooting channel, so might there be some historical commentary. The 3rd Battalion Grenadier Guards sailed with the so-called Army of the East when it was sent in the spring of 1854 to the Black Sea to fight the Russians in support of the Ottoman Empire. After staging near Constantinople at Scutari and then a somewhat brief foray to Varna in Bulgaria, the army embarked for the Crimea, where it was hoped that the Russian naval base at Sevastopol could be taken. The Grenadiers, along with their comrades of the 1st Battalion Coldstream Guards and the 1st Battalion of the Scots Fusilier Guards, as they were then known, formed the Guards Brigade and were paired with the Highland Brigade in the 1st Division under the Duke of Cambridge. After making landfall in the Crimea, they were promptly in action at the Battle of the Elma, where, dressed in their bearskins and scarlet jackets, they ascended the Russian-held heights south of the river and assaulted the Great Redoubt. The battle was a victory, and the Minier rifle issued to every man had its baptism of fire in a major battle. Reaching Sevastopol, the army, along with their French allies, besieged the city in an operation that would last nearly a year. The Grenadiers' greatest effort would come on the 5th of November 1854, as they, along with the Coldstream and Scots Fusilier Guards, won everlasting fame for their dogged assault and defense of the Sandbag Battery. Dressed in their grey woolen greatcoats, but still proudly wearing their towering bearskin caps, they fought an incredible action which to this day is known as the Soldier's Battle. If this is of interest, I might direct you to the five-part Inkerman series here on the channel, where you can find all kinds of detail and perhaps derive some understanding of the near impossible difficulties that were overcome in holding on to ultimate victory. It came at a horrible cost. The 3rd Grenadiers marched into action with some 500 all ranks and came out of action with under 250. So with that background, one might understand why I chose to shoot the challenge in the way that I did this year. There were some interesting if somewhat obvious observations. The guards jealously held on to their privilege of wearing the bearskin cap throughout the campaign, and it remains the last time that the bearskin was worn in action. They are not particularly heavy and are made of black bear fur stretched across a wicker frame. As aptly demonstrated by me, they are not the best form of headdress for dynamic shooting, though it would seem that the bearskin worn in the mid-Victorian era did afford somewhat better visibility as the fall of the fur at the front was commonly off the face. In the 1850s, cap pouches had not yet become completely standardized. In the Grenadiers, caps were carried in a small leather pouch let into the right front of the coatee in the lower abdomen area. This arrangement, however, was not universal, and the Coldstream Guards, for instance, carried theirs in a small pouch sewn directly to the pouch belt. For the Grenadiers, this would pose an issue as at Inkerman the great coat was worn, and therefore the cap pouch would have been covered. I simply elected to use the pocket of the great coat and carried loose caps there. Not the best, but perhaps the only solution. It did lead to some difficulty in reaching them due to the presence of other items of kit, namely the haversack, which hung directly in the way. Ultimately though, that was just more friction I had to work through. The personal kit presented some interesting obstacles as well. The army of the era carried their ammunition pouch and bayonet joined with small straps very low on the backside. While this may have made it easier to reach, my belts do not extend that far, and reaching the pouch when attached at the rear was near impossible. Therefore, I elected to undo the small strap, thus allowing the pouch to be brought around to the hip for easier access. Was this done in reality? Perhaps. It is a very simple adjustment to make once the small strap is undone. The other aspect that came to bear was that of the last round. As I lay down, 
Both flaps of the pouch opened up just enough to allow for the last cartridge to fall out. Ultimately, it was easily overcome, but had I needed to move, I would have been forced somewhat unceremoniously to finish the challenge with my bayonet. The ammunition pouch shown in this video was made by Graham the Leather Guy. If you're in the market for top quality Victorian accoutrements, he's your man. If you're in need of exceptionally high quality and historic ammunition for your P53 Enfield, then stop by Brett's website, papercartridges.com. He makes P51 ammunition as well. I must thank friend of the channel, Harry, a serving member of the Grenadier Guards, who provided the plume and the valise plate that I mounted to the ammunition pouch. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. For more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page. What was once Utreon is now Player. It still remains a good alternative to YouTube and Patreon, as those platforms have become rather troublesome for content as found on this channel. May I suggest following British muzzleloaders there as well. If you'd like to view British muzzleloaders and many other channels in an ad-free environment, free from the content restraints of YouTube and other platforms, then I might suggest you head on over to History of Weapons and War, where you can subscribe and find this channel and many like it, presented as they should be, all in one place.